coming up on Foundation for Life with Dr. Waylon Bailey. Who are we? We are members of a new eternal family. And when we get to heaven, there will be people there from every tribe and every nation and every language and every people group because the gospel is going out into all the world. talking about the basics of the Christian faith. And I've talked about the church. I want to talk about the church again today. Because for this day, which is, will be a historic day for us, the day we came back after the being safer at home, uh, we came back and we gathered together. Uh, this will be a very historic day. And we need to talk about the church. We need to talk about who we are. We need to talk about why God has chosen us. We need to talk about why God has put us in this place, as, uh, as the book of Esther says, for such a time as this. Sometimes I have to remind ourselves, we're not three congregations, 6 p.m. Saturday, 9 a.m. Sunday, 11 a.m. Sunday. I have to remind myself, we're not three congregations, but today we're not six congregations either because there are more people watching by live stream in each of these services than are present. But we are one congregation. We are the family of God. We are the people of God. And it is all about him and about who he is. So I want you to think about who you are and who we are in Christ. And let's hear what Simon Peter, who was with Jesus from the beginning, who was with him in the ups and downs, not Jesus' ups and downs, Peter's ups and downs, and became one, not the leader, but one of the leaders of the church. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Peter has talked about, about obedience. He has talked about being holy. He has talked about being obedient to God. And so he says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that it, by it you may grow up in your salvation. We all have to grow up in our salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, meaning Jesus, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I, have, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. The beautiful name of Jesus. This stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble. And a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. When it came, became clear that we were going to get to regather, I immediately turned to this theme in this passage of Scripture. And about the same time, I read a little story from a pastor writing to other pastors. And, and of all things, he said exactly what I needed to say. He told about, he told about a family in his church. Uh, their name was Ward. And he said they had a grandson born. And that grandson was named Nathaniel Ziga, Z-I-G-A, Ward. And he started talking about the names of this child, the three names of this child. The, the name Ward, a family name, a surname we call it. We, we don't really call it a surname very much. We don't think about a surname, but the family name. We, we all got our surnames because somewhere in the past, if your name is Baker, you can figure out what your ancestor did. He was John the Baker somewhere back the way, and they gave him a surname that identified who he was. And so we're part of a family, part of a, a little family. And we know about our families, and we care about our families. And, and in spite of the fact that we've maybe been together a little more than we wanted to be, we've learned that we know and value our families. And so this family's name was Ward. The first name was Nathaniel, a Hebrew name. The first name is also called what? The given name and the Christian name. But most of it just called, what's your first name? And so, so this boy's name, this child's name, is Nathaniel, a Hebrew word that means given of God. If your name is Nathan or Nathaniel or Nate, you, you have a great, game, a great name. I, have, I am given of God. I am a gift of God. But guess what? We're all gifts of God, and we are all given by God, and we all matter to him, and we are all his children. But this little boy was named Nathaniel Ziga because his mother was Rwandan, African, and in her language, Ziga means remember who you are. So the pastor said, here is little given by God, remember who you are, Ward. Well, nobody wants to call him that, but you get the point. This boy got off to a good start of knowing who he is. And all of us need to know who we are. Sometimes we get all confused in life and, and do a lot of things that we never intended to do. And somebody will say, I'm just trying to figure out who I am. The problem is you will never find out who you are by going off and doing horrendous things. You'll never figure out who you are by living an impure life. You will never figure out who you are for, by living for self. But we find out who we are when we open the Word of God and let God's Word speak to us. And 1 Peter chapter 2 is all about who we are. So let's ask the question, who are we? Who are we as this local expression of the body of Christ? And who are we as the universal body of Christ? Two billion people around the world right now, about this time period, worshiping God, most of them in their homes rather than in a worship service like this. We have to know who we are. So what you find in this passage of Scripture is this. The first thing is that we are people who are chosen and called of God. We are here 
because of God. We are here because of what Christ did for us. We are here because we have been chosen. Two times in this passage of Scripture, Simon Peter mentions this. The first is in verse, is in verse 5. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9, you are a chosen people. Now remember, the people of Israel were chosen people. They were elect. But in the Old Testament, the word elect doesn't mean look at me. It means look at God through my eyes. It means that we have a responsibility. We are elect to do something. We are chosen to do something. And you and I are chosen people. We are called. We are chosen we are called to the newness of life in Christ. We're called to be new people. Look again at this passage. Simon Peter begins, what is he talking about? He's talking about how we live, how we behave. He talks about what we are doing. Therefore, since you belong to God, that's what he said in chapter 1, he said you are holy people God is holy, and you are called to be holy, to be blameless, to be righteous. Since you are called in therefore that way, therefore rid yourselves of all malice. Malice, the Greek word for malice is a, malice is a, a generic word, a general word to describe evil. So get rid of evil of every kind. Be ruthless in looking at your life and asking, what does God want me to do and what does God not want me to do? So get rid of all malice and get rid of all deceit. Let's speak the truth in deep and abiding love. And sometimes speaking the truth in love means you don't say anything. You don't say what you want to say. That's speaking the truth in love. But if you have to speak, make sure that it is in love. Get rid of all deceit. Get rid of hypocrisy. Let's, let's live real lives before God. And let's be genuine. And if you have a problem being genuine, ask God to... Help you to be genuine. God, please change me. Help me to live new in you. Get rid of envy. We live in this really nice parish. There's a lot of money here. And a lot of us live it by envy. Get rid of envy and slander. What you say about other people. Get rid of slander of every kind. But what do we do? What do you put in place of all that? You desire pure spiritual milk. He's using the, the picture of a baby having to be nurtured and nourished by its mother. He says, we are babes in Christ and crave that pure spiritual milk and get on quickly to the meat of God's word and let that be who you are. Live in the newness of life in Christ. I've told you this many times before. The, the natural tendency when you come to church is to do this. The natural tendency is to, to say, you know, I heard God speaking today, and, and it was nice to be with the family of God, and it was nice to be here, and wonderful to be here. I'm going to be better this week. How many times have you said that? I, I'm going to do better. I'm going to be better this week. And there's nothing wrong with that. My goodness, the, for that to happen, for us to feel what, that way, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. The problem is it won't really last and it won't really make a difference. But what will make a difference is when God is allowed to be inside of us by the work of his spirit and he begins to change us on the inside all the way to the outside. And when that happens, all of a sudden, without really thinking about it, and really, I'm going to be better, you, you find that 
that your attitude is different and the way you talk is different and the way you think about people is different and all of a sudden you begin to see the truth of the gospel working in your life. That is the, the greatest confirmation that the gospel is real when you see yourself changing and becoming different because of the power of God in your life. God sent his son to die for you, to make you totally new and different. If any person is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. That's not reformation. That's creation, a new creation. This is who we are as the family of God. We are chosen and called We're called to be transformed. The beautiful picture of of the Christian life is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. It's It's in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transformed in Greek is metamorphosis. That describes a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Now, I promise you, if you ever look at a monarch butterfly and look at a caterpillar, you will never associate the two. In no way would you ever think of them in any sense. But the butterfly comes from the caterpillar. And what God wants to do in me and in you is to transform that caterpillar into a butterfly. We are chosen and called to newness in Christ. We are called to Christ. We're called to be like him. The great goal of the Christian life is, again, not being reformed, not being better, but to be like Jesus and to let God's Spirit work in us in such a wonderful and powerful way that everybody around us will notice that we are different because of what Christ has done within us. Who are we? We are people who belong to a new, eternal family. It's been so much fun over these 10 weeks to get texts and emails and phone calls and a few note cards from all of you saying, I have learned what the church is that is not a building that even though we say we're going to church what we mean is we're going to meet with the church and so many people have learned no we are the church and even though uh, we 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 don't we don't get to gather together we know we are the church Some some around our computer screen, some around a smartphone viewing this, and others gathered together. We are the church. We've been called to a new family, and we are the family of God. And so many people have said, I can't wait to get back to church. But it didn't mean to get back to this place. It didn't mean to hear me. It meant to be with my family. We are a new family. Family, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Most of you, if you've been in church in a long time, that, that idea of brothers and sisters in Christ, I think, goes right over our heads. We kind of miss it. We kind of misunderstand what it means. We kind of misunderstand the revolutionary nature of what it means to be the family of God. But I've heard many of you say we are closer to the people we go to church with than to my own family whom I love. We are part of the family of God. You remember when Jesus was teaching one day, it's one of those striking things in Scripture. It's one of those things where you say this should not have happened. Uh, this, This was not right. Jesus was teaching in a house. And though the the scripture doesn't say it exactly, you get the impression that somebody came up to him, kind of like behind me, put his hand on his shoulder, pulled him down, and the man spoke into Jesus' ear and said, your mother and your brothers are here 
for you. Well, the thing that makes that awkward and the reason why we say that shouldn't have happened is is because they didn't believe him. And they thought he had lost his mind. I mean, that's all. It doesn't say that, but that's the, the common interpretation through the years. And, and, and you just get that feel that you need to come home with us. Enough talk about being the Son of God. Enough talk about I and the Father are one. Enough talk about I've been sent to seek and to save those who are lost. It's time to come home. But Jesus didn't go home. But he, in a sense, answered the question. He said, who are my brothers and sisters? Now, he wasn't rejecting family. On the cross, Jesus said, son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. And he was doing exactly what we would want him to do, exactly what a, a man, we would want any man to do. I'm taking care of my mom. He was doing that. But he said, who are my brothers and my sisters? And then he defined it. My brothers and my sisters are those who hear the word of God and do it. Believers. Followers. Now all of that is striking, isn't it? But there's, there's a part to this that goes more than that. When Jesus said, these are my brothers and sisters... They didn't think of the word brothers like we do. What do we say? I, I have my brothers and I play golf. Not my brother, I only have one of those. My brothers and I play golf. You just name them your brothers. Sometimes we, we talk about people who work in the same place, my brothers. Sometimes people, political candidates, they say all of these are my brothers. And so it's common for us to say that, but when Jesus said, who are my brothers and my sisters, it was never said of somebody, you are my brother, if they weren't a literal brother, if they weren't a literal sister. So when Jesus said that, he was saying something no one had ever heard before. He knew that he was creating a family of God and that these were going to be people who were brought together who were going to live together for the, for the glory of God, for the power of God, for the work of God. Who are we? We are members of a new eternal family. And when we get to heaven, there will be people there from every tribe and every nation and every language and every people group because the gospel is going out into all the world. Who are we? Well, we are ministers, all of us. We are ministers of a living hope. Peter said, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are the people, the family of God. You were called, look at verse 9 and verse 10. You were called that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are people who have been called as ministers of a living hope. And so I pray that the last 10 weeks you've been ministering in the way you could minister and if you haven't been, I pray that today marks the turning point and you look for ways in which you show the, the hope that you have in Christ and that you minister in the name of Christ and you talk about the reason. It is in, it is in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where Peter said, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have in Christ. That's for everybody. It's not for the guy who stands up here and talks. It's for all of us who join together in the name of Christ. We, we minister 
in the living hope that we have in Christ. We are going to be fine. As long as we hold on to Christ and minister in His name, we're going to be fine. We're going to be doing His will. Some, some mentor or pastors said this week he gave five reasons why churches ought to have hope. Number five was this. It's on your screen. God sustained us during the pandemic. And I love the way he expressed it. And he's not going away. And he's not. And the church is his church. And we are his people. Call for a purpose. Do you know in this church, in, in 10 weeks, in when we didn't have a service and didn't give an invitation, over 40 people had joined our church. I laughed with one uh, long-term Baptist on the phone who was transferring her membership, and I, I'm finding out about her, and she's telling me her testimony and how she came to know the Lord. And, you know, of all things, you can do that on the phone just like you can do it face-to-face. -face. And so, so she was telling me that, and after I heard her story, I laughed, and I said, in your wildest imagination, did you ever think you would be joining a church by phone? And she laughed. And I said, you ought to think of how strange that feels on the other end of this conversation. So all of these people have become members of our church by profession of faith. But by saying, I, I trusted the Lord a long time ago, but I've never followed him in baptism. I'm ready to be baptized. We, a lot of people by profession of faith and baptism and transferring their membership. And I want to be, I want to be, most often, I want to be connected. I want to be connected to the family of God. I've prayed that God would draw you to himself. I have no idea what God wants to do within you. But you know, because of the work of the Spirit within you, you know what. He wants to do. Would you let him do that? Just an openness, just a willingness to say, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. What a great confession that is. Whatever you want is what I want. And I want to give myself unto you. Live on the North Shore or planning to visit? Join us here at First Baptist Church Covington for one of our three weekend services. Come be encouraged by Dr. Bailey every Saturday evening at 6 or Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11 a.m. For more information and directions to our church, visit fbccov.org. First Baptist Church Covington. Experience life-changing relationships. Be sure to tune in again next week for Foundation for Life.